이것은 배우고 익히며 성장합니다. 나보다 나를 더잘 압니다. 인공지능. 지능을 가진 것처럼 행동하는 기계. 요슈아 벤지오는 세계 AI 4대 석학으로 손꼽히는 공학자입니다. 인공지능 세계의 언어와 규칙을 그 누구보다 잘하는 사람이죠. 요슈아 벤지오와 함께 이제는 우리가 인공지능의 머릿속을 들여다볼까요? Welcome to We Day and Su Up, the Great Minds. My name is Yasha b e n j i o professor at University of Montreal in computer science, and I'm a researcher in AI. Govern how, for example, our brain learns, and if we can understand those principles, we can program computers to have that learning ability, and then in the they can acquire all the knowledge that they need. So. Um, This is really the heart of the machine learning approach to AI. Somebody or a machine or an animal to take intelligent decisions, it needs knowledge. So the question is, where is that knowledge going to come from? And machine learning says, part of it needs to be Learned. Now there is a particular way to train machines to do things, to understand things, and that's the deep learning way, the neural net way, as we called it in the 80s when I started. To understand the challenge of. Training a computer to learn something, we're going to go through a very simple example. Imagine we want the computer to recognize the digits in images, um, the objects in images. So, for example, here the computer sees the image of uh, letter two, and it says six, so it's making a mistake. So what we're going to do is we're going to be the teacher, and we're going to tell the uh, computer, which is like a student that is learning, well, no, it's it's not six. The right answer is two. And then we're going to allow the computer to change itself, to change some parameters, some uh, numbers in the machine, so that next time it sees. The same image, it's going to produce something closer to the right answer. Now, a single example would not be sufficient. We're going to be training that computer with lots and lots of examples. Each example in the supervised learning case, which is the simple scenario I showed you up to now, involves two kinds of things: the input, the computer sees an image, and The correct answer, the target answer, we would like the computer to produce. So, for example, um, we could have uh, images of airplanes, automobiles, birds, cats, deer, s dogs, and so on. And so, we're going to present these examples one at a time, and we're going to uh, allow the computer to produce an answer. Initially, it's going to be very bad answers, but As it corrects itself, one example at a time, it's going to get better at it. This set of examples for supervised learning is uh, is going to be the heart of what allows knowledge to get into the computer. So it's going to practice producing the right answers. And this is how eventually he's going to learn how to recognize airplanes, birds, cats, and so on. In other words, 
in your life, at each moment, you're facing inputs like images, sounds that you have never seen. Everything you're living is for the first time. How do you manage to come up with the right actions, the right behavior, the right understanding, in spite of the fact that it's always novel? This is what we call generalization. And it gets harder and harder as the dimension of the data increases from, say, just one variable that can take 10 values to two variables each can take 10 values, so that's 10 times 10 possible configurations, that's 100. Three variables, each taking 10 values, that's 10 times 10 times 10, that's 1,000 possibilities. And then, of course, if I had 1,000 variables, that's 10 times 10 times 10, 1,000 times. It's a huge number. There's no way the computer will see all of these possible configurations. So, what can we do? It seems hopeless. Well, the good news is that mathematicians figured out that if the computer doesn't have so much freedom, so much capacity to learn anything, we constrain it. If we constrain it sufficiently, it can't just learn everything by heart. It has to generalize and produce hopefully reasonable answers on new cases. So this is the basis of what's called statistical learning theory. How do humans learn? We live through each moment one after the other. We live through each day one after the other. We don't need to wait the end of our life before we change something in our head. It goes on all the time. So we can't compute the exact gradient that would you know, make our life better if we were to relive it another time. Uh, we have to let go and, and sort of just take a little bit of information, a little bit of data at a time, and, and make a change that may not be exactly right, but that is right in average. So if we were to repeat those changes many times, actually, we would converge to something pretty good. And so there's a bit of a noise in that gradient. That's why we call it stochastic gradient. And it turns out that this method, which we did not imagine could work, but is really similar to how humans learn, this method called stochastic gradient descent works incredibly well. In fact, um, Theory researchers are still trying to understand why it works so well. Not only does it allow us to learn much more efficiently, but it also allows to generalize well. And that's really something we did not expect. So in other words, our brain is changing in a kind of noisy ways because we don't get to see all of the possible examples and we change all the time and each of us is changing in a slightly different way but that's very efficient um, when we train a neural net with a data set of a million examples if we were to wait for seeing all the examples in other words the machine would practice all one million examples one after the other and then change the parameters a little bit, and then do it again and again, it would just take forever. It would be thousands of times slower than the method that uses what we call stochastic gradient. So that method um, was a big surprise and, and really works well. Now, we're not done because these neural nets in addition to their parameters, they have many knobs, many uh, decisions have to be taken about how we're going to design them, how we're going to train them. For example, once we have computed the gradient, um, it gives us for each weight um, a, an amount that we would like to change the weight, but we still have to decide um, how big the step should be. 
And um, that's one global number we have to decide called the learning rate. We don't know how to set it. There's, you know, there are many methods that propose how to do that, but, but really it's something we, we have to play with. Um, so when we train our neural net, we're going to try different settings of that number, that learning rate. Humans use attention to focus on some parts of their input, to focus on some memories, or to focus on some thoughts, and ignore a lot of things. And this is a notion that for many years, researchers have tried to put into neural nets. But in 2014, 2015, we had a breakthrough in uh, achieving this. And it has changed completely the field of um, uh, neural language processing, that is, how computers process texts. And uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about this. It started with the work we were doing in machine translation. In other words, how computers can translate from one language to another language. So say from English to Korean, that would be useful here. Um, so the computer sees a sequence of words in one language, and then it produces a word in the other language one at a time. But if you think about how you translate, when you translate the next word, you probably want to pay special attention to one or two words in the source sentence that correspond really to, to the one you want to produce. Uh, this is something we didn't know how to do beforehand. And when we introduce that kind of attention mechanism in the uh, neural nets, the performance in machine translation improved greatly. Now, one important aspect of this discovery is that we're not telling the computer where to look, where to attend. The computer is learning by itself where it needs to attend. What should we do to make sure that AI is used properly? What it means for me as a researcher is a responsibility to think about this question. It's a responsibility for AI scientists. It's a responsibility for engineers who design new products. It's a responsibility for entrepreneurs who uh, put together organizations and companies that put out these products. And it's a responsibility for governments who set the rules of the games and the incentive system that are going to have a very important influence about how AI is going to be deployed and what is going to be its social impact. And why do we care? Because we want AI to be beneficial for all humans. And AI is powerful, and it's become more powerful and will become even more powerful in the future. Now, we have to remember AI is not a person. It's not something magical. It's just a tool. It's a tool that we, the humans, are building. And normally, we build tools because we need them we want them, we can use them for something that we care about. However, we know that tools can sometimes be used in a way that's bad for people. Um, the same technology, like nuclear technology, could be dual use, could be beneficial in medicine, but could be very dangerous as a weapon. And the same thing can happen with AI. It could be exploited to increase the power of some people. It could be used in a foolish way that could destroy a lot of things. Or it could save us from 
a lot of the challenges that we're facing in the future. So the big question is, are we going to have the right wisdom to use those powerful tools in the future? I feel sometimes like we are children playing with things that we don't completely understand. And that scares me. There is a kind of race between the power of our tools. We're building more and more powerful toys, but we're still children. At least many of us are not really taking the right decisions. And that has caused, as we've seen, a lot of the problems, for example, with the pandemic and climate change. It's like we're not rational. We are emotional beings. And our, our cognition can sometimes lead us to take the wrong decisions. So it's really important that we make progress in our collective wisdom to manage those tools before they blow up in our face.